Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. Brent Waters, the Emeritus Professor of Christian Social Ethics at uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And we are talking about his book, This Mortal Flesh, Incarnation and Bioethics. Dr. Waters, wonderful to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, So tell me a little bit why this book. Why did you write this book? Well, at the time, there was a lot of, uh, how shall we say, giddy talk about the new innovations in, in medicine, particularly embryonic stem cell research. This was to usher in a new golden age of uh, medicine, and that basically we were going to solve all the problems of being embodied, okay? Because we, we could find the cures, we could find the preventions, we could find the enhancements. And what I was basically trying to say is it's probably not going to be that easy. It rarely is. And that also maybe we were created to be embodied. So after all, I mean, the incarnation is about that affirmation of embodiment is that the word became flesh, dwelt among us, lived, died, and was resurrected as an, you know, I mean, God becoming a human being means God became an embodied being. Um, Mm. Now in retrospect, um, I think, if anything, um, I've become more convinced that it's important to emphasize embodiment because I think medicine is changing uh, and we're in the midst of a a big change in medicine where slowly but surely the body, we've moved away from the body as an object of care to the body as a problem to be solved. And if you think the body is a problem to be solved, I think that really skews both how medicine is practiced and what the relationship is between physician and patient. And I think it also, for theologians, there's the temptation then that we slip into a kind of Gnosticism or uh, Manichaeism where we see salvation as being saved from our bodies and not being saved as embodied beings. So now, having said all that, as I grow older uh, and my body gets less and less cooperative, um, I mean, there are certain kinds of things I want to say that, uh, you know, I understand it's tough being embodiment, but that is about being embodied, but that's how we were created. And. And that's how we, uh, you know, uh, serve serve God and our neighbor. Do you see a connection between? Uh, and uh, I'm I'm making a leap here, but it does seem our society struggles with the idea of aging. And do you see a connection between that and uh, this struggle against embodiment? Yes, I, I think they're directly connected. That we yeah. want as much as possible to deny aging. So even. Even I mean, in my lifetime, you've seen a big change on just the portrayal of what it means to be retired. I mean, when mm-hmm. I was young, the retired person was someone who sat in a rocking chair and dozed during the day. <laughs> and, and now the retired person is someone who plays endless rounds of golf or, or, or some other sporting activity. You see the advertisements for the retirement communities and, and basically what they remind me of being back in a dorm. Um, so there, there's... There's this notion that somehow we can be aging through through proper kind of care and, and, and management. And and I think, you know, as I grow older, I, I just really think that the per, whoever said the new 60s is the old 40s will have much to atone for in the day of judgment because I just don't think it's true. Mm. Yeah. I, it almost, instead of a second childhood, people are looking for a second college age. Is that kind of? I think uh, in many <laughs> respects they are. I mean, in, I mean, it's um I'm not sure I want to spend the rest of my time, you know, listening to the to the Stones and the Who for the rest of my life. <laughs> I uh, I mean, this this strikes home for me because we live very close to the villages, and it is definitely like when you talk about like I'd never thought about that kind of model of it with the like, you know, partying at college, like these party colleges, but like the villages are infamous, <laughs> absolutely infamous for being party town central, right? So that's that's a really interesting 
I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to sit on that one for a little bit. That's really interesting. <laughs> um, so and you you kind of mentioned this, and uh, maybe there is no difference. And if so, that's interesting to me as well. Do you do you see a difference between the term incarnation and uh, between the terms incarnation and embodiment? And if so, what would that difference be? And if not, you know. Well, I think what incarnation is, is is a theological way of understanding the importance of embodiment and also understanding the importance of of the whole playing out of creation redemption and 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 eschatology within within the christian tradition so it's it's a way of linking the two that um uh, contrary to much to, to certain kinds of temptations um the christian tradition has always tried to affirm um that the physicality of one's faith is important, the materiality of it. It's not something to be despised. Um, so that I think sometimes we think is, you know, only the spiritual counts, but it, I don't think that's true because if it's only the spiritual counts then why are we commanded to love our neighbor when our mm. neighbors are embodied, they're material and most of their needs require some kind of response to their physicality and the materiality. So it's, I mean, I, I, for, I forget the name of the theologian, but she, she once wrote a great line, which has said that, that within the Christian tradition, Christians have always been tempted to despise the body, and they've always resisted at the last moment. Mm. And I think that's important to remember that most of the heresies that we've dealt with within the Christian tradition somehow despises the body. So that's, if it eventually gets around to that, so that you want to transcend it, you want to get rid of it, something like that. I, and I think the transhumanists now, are, are somewhat in that category. They want to make us better than human, which means basically getting rid of the body. Yeah, I, I'm reminded a lot of, uh, as you're talking about this, the incarnation is the uh, reaffirmation of what we learn in creation, right? This idea that like God you know, looked at it and said, it's very good. And he said that after making humans, right? Um, and of course there would be that. And I think this is where the temptation comes in, right? You see the fall, you see sin, and you're like, well, now it's broken. Now it's bad. And he's like, no, 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 still good. Like literally so good. My son comes. Um, and it, I'm just processing here. But even as you're talking about this, um, I have a lot of uh, conversations about stuff like this. And I constantly come back to the passage in James that talks about um, if you say be warmed and filled, but you don't actually feed <laughs> and you don't actually warm the person. And I mean, this is not just a Christian thing, right? Like there's lots of people who have like good intentions or say like uh, good wishes, you know, well, I wish them well. And then they don't do anything material. And it's, yeah. Uh, so I think there's, there's a broader uh, I, I just agreement on, on how people mess up on this and what doing it right it's not that it's hard it's just that it takes effort and care well it does and it's also so ordinary and mundane yes boring I mean, yeah it's boring it's exactly right and yet maybe that's how we learn to love one another is by doing those daily boring routines i mean okay i'm, I'm, I'm you know my daughter's an adult now but i found most of being being a parent was just doing really dull boring stuff I mean, and it's just day in and day out um, and it, you, it's, it, that's how humans are. That's how we relate to one another. And I think that that's important to keep, to keep that notion that we sometimes get so fixated on the first command, we forget the second great commandment. Um, and the two are, I think, intimately relinked, linked, and that's where the incarnation comes in. I think that's what ties them together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that really strikes home for me. You know, I have a, a three-year-old who's potty training right now, and it doesn't feel important to uh, when he fails to wipe his butt. But it is very important, and it is definitely not exciting. <laughs> no, it's not. Not exciting at all. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the chapters that really stuck out to me in your book is uh, titled, let me make sure I say this correctly, uh, What is Christian About Christian Bioethics? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's a, maybe a good segue here to talk about what the incarnation really teaches us. Yeah, I mean, uh, we during, when I wrote the book, too, we were starting to go through a phase where um, Christian bioethics was increasingly looking like secular bioethics. Mm. 
in that it was getting fixated on procedures, on questions of fairness, accessibility. Now, those are all important questions, but they're not distinctly Christian questions, because I think that secular bioethics wants to avoid normative claims about what is a good life, what is a good human being, and therefore what is a good death and other kinds of questions. I think as Christians, we want to be normative. We want to say we want to make certain kinds of claims about what it means to be a good human being, what it means to have a, a, a good life and therefore a good death, and what it means to, you know, faithfulness and things like, like the, these kinds of questions. So to be distinctly, I think, Christian bioethics means you, it's, it's, a, it's a theological discipline. Uh, a Christian bioethics is first and foremost a Christian, and secondly, a, a philosopher or a theologian. And, and that's what really what the, the, the book was in many ways a, a kind of stumbling attempt to, to draw about various lines. And, and one of the ways I wanted to start with was the incarnation, because it means, because that's, like I said, I mean, that's, that's just a startling claim. And I think it, yeah. it either makes no sense to non-believers or is even insulting to some people that you would be so audacious as to claim that the God you worship actually became one of you. Uh, and yet, I think that's at the core of our faith. I mean, I mean, I, it's, it's unfortunate that the incarnation just gets linked with Advent and Christmas. I mean, it's, it's just not about a baby. It's about the, the entire content of our faith. Uh, you mentioned a little bit like these, this normative claim about the good. And eventually, everyone has a normative claim about the good life, right? At least for themselves. Like, everyone prescribes a good life for themselves, at least. Right. Even if they don't, they part of their good life is not prescribing for others. But that's a, a different discussion. Um what are some of the goods that you, do you have like um, different models of what the good life looks like that you can talk about? Well, that's, I mean, we, we don't have three hours. <laughs> um, How about the, we can start with the Christian one and maybe, well, maybe an example that you find very common past that. You know, it's, it's the good life, I think, for the, for the Christian, and it means that you're talking about the faithful life as well. And I'm almost, I mean, this, I'm, I'm finding ways to get me off the hook here. But, you know, it's, I forget the Supreme Court judge who once said, you know, I, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. Yeah, yeah. And I think living a good and faithful life is I, I can't define it with precision, but I know it when I see it mm. in others. And I think it has something to do that they are at peace with themselves, they are at peace with God, and they are at peace with their neighbors. And life hasn't become an artifact of their will. Life has become a gift that they have embraced. And, they, and, and it's maybe not the gift they were anticipating. It's maybe not the gift that they were expecting. But it, I, I think you said earlier when we were talking, it fell into their lap. And they learned to love it and to nurture it and to, and to care for it. And in ways sometimes that they did not expect, and in ways that prove very difficult. I mean, mm. uh, again, there's there's that wonderful line from both the movie and the short story. A river runs through it, where the, the Presbyterian minister in his last sermon, he's he's still troubled by the death of his older son, but he has that wonderful line where he says, "We come to love people fully whom we never fully understand." And I think that that's basically where. I think coming to terms with this, coming to peace with a life is going to be far from perfect. And that's where embodiment has a lot to teach us because our bodies are never going to be perfect. And we're going to have to deal with unexpected times throughout a life phase. I mean, early on, I had to face the fact, finally, after many misadventures, I was not blessed with an athletic body or athletic skills <laughs> and you know, had, had to change at that point. And, you know, as you go through life, then different kinds of issues come up. You begin to face surgeries, illnesses, things like that. And you could, I can see the opportunity. I mean, you're tempted to become bitter through this. But, but on the other hand, you begin to say, but this is what has fallen into me. And how do, how do, I, how do I make my peace with that? And how do I allow? And then there again, I think peace is not so much something we achieve. It's received like a gift of grace uh, unexpectedly and in moments that one cannot anticipate. Uh, and I think there's, uh, I think there's an interesting kind of uh, path here in the conversation. I had um, a good friend of mine who became the first hospice chaplain in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, on to talk about um, spirituality and health. And one of the things he talked about is 
our society promises holistic health. And re- by that, he means the promise of wholeness and health, that you will be whole, you will be complete, and will be able to maintain that. And uh, he said that is essentially problematic to promise that to people. And, uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, there's all these things like, you know, like everyone else, I'm like trying to eat well and all these other things. And I didn't think about it. Like I cracked a tooth and it was removed and <laughs> like, I'm never going to get that tooth back. Like that, that tooth is gone. Right. <laughs> and it's like that, um, that is something that I have to make peace with. Right. That's a small thing. Right. Like, I mean, that's nothing like people dealing with the effects of cancer or kidney transplants or these sorts of things. But the, this is a, and it, being grateful for the embodiment uh, means in many ways being grateful for the, the weakness that accompanies that. And when you talk about transhumanism, they're trying to get rid of that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you, you know, I, I think it, if, if the transhumanists have their way, then it's going to be an excellent exercise in learning unintended consequences. Because, you know, what what do you do when you've disposed of something that suddenly you begin to realize is very important? Um, and also, I think, you know, you're, you know, stepping back for a moment in your conversation, your friend, I mean, one of the, one of the things I've discovered through going through a, a nascent, um, knee surgery and, and rehab is that medicine, because cause the rehab has been very difficult, and there's been some missteps and that kind of things. And what I've discovered is that as medicine becomes more and more specialized, that means the people you encounter can do less and less for you. And there is no specialty emerging of creating the patient as person, as a whole, whole person. And that gets lost in, in now, granted, med- medicine's much more, it's much better than it was a century ago. But nonetheless, you are beginning to lose this, this capacity to think, I think, of the patient as, as, as a person in a sense, so that my surgeon's a very good surgeon, but all he sees is my knee. And, and really couldn't even treat some related problems in the rehab because that's his, that's, that was the focus of it. Um, and I think that's going to be a problem because also, I mean, and another experience I had was, was also, you know, getting back to the ordinary and the mundane of how, how important that is, is that, um, uh, about five years ago, I, I had Legionnaire's disease, so I ended up in the ICU for nine days, five of them on a ventilator. And I found out later they were preparing my wife to be a widow, and then and, and that didn't happen. But I ended up, when you're incapacitated like that, you lose a lot of, I mean, your, your muscles atrophy and you lose about 45 pounds. So I'm in the rehab, oh. intense rehab for three weeks, learning basic things like how to feed myself, how to dress myself, and... That's when I realized, okay, maybe the physicians healed me, but it was the nurses who were there day in and day out. And it was the nurses who tended with the things that were really most important to me, like how do I feed myself? How do I get to the restroom? How do I begin to do the exercises that are going to restore my function? Um, And what I discovered then was that my work as a theologian and a bioethicist had been too esoteric that I wanted to start getting back to saying, oh, rather than talking about embodiment, maybe I should start thinking about embodied persons. And I think maybe medicine is slipping into the same track trap is that it's beginning to think about esoteric issues related to medicine, which is good. I mean, somebody's got to do that, but how do you get that back to really thinking about the need of, of embodied patients and not thinking about embodied patients as abstractions? And again, I think that's where the Christian faith has something to offer people because I'm thinking of some our, our some of our key functions of our faith, like the Eucharist, baptism, are very physical, you know, visual events. Absolutely, and I want to come back to that. I have that uh, a question about that written down. Um, but you talked about unintended consequences, and I feel like there's a relation there to talking about the nurses being the one who were there to care for your body afterwards. Um, can you spell that out for us a little bit more about what you think those unintended consequences are? Uh, it feels like there's almost, would one of those be the loss of being able to love on your neighbor if we were these like brains in a vat sort of thing? Yes. I mean, I think it, 
And I think it's a frightening prospect because I think what the transhumanists really want to create is a risk-free world. Because as long as you're embodied, you're going to encounter risk. But to create a risk-free world is to create a loveless world because you can't love without risk. And that means that the consequent, the unintended consequences is what will it mean to live in a world where not only is love probably not possible, but unwanted. Um, and I think we're beginning maybe perhaps to see kind of hints of that now with, uh, oh, uh, the notion that uh, some of the kind of the woke things that are going on in the culture where an inability to forgive um, and a constant judge, judgmentalism that goes with that. Um, it, so, the, you know, my, and I, I guess the, what I'm trying to capture is the notion that I, I don't want to think people, think that for, for people I'm, I'm advocating recklessness. I'm not. But I am advocating risk. Take a risk. Take a risk on other people on, on things because that's the only way I think you can love them. Is you have to take that risk. I mean, if there's a risk in parenthood, there's a risk in marriage, the risk of uh, that first date, or, you know, uh, having your heart broken. Uh, those may seem trivial, but I think they're important lessons to learn. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I wouldn't say a trivial, but like a less uh, intense example is the first date, right? Like, I mean, you like, it is risky to go on a first date and the, the rewards can be tremendous, right? I mean, this idea of opening yourself up and finding that right person, but you can go and that person, like it could be a waste of time. It could, they could, uh, you know, you could actually be attracted to them and then they reject you and that would hurt. Right. Um, and, but to never go on first dates or, you know, whatever, uh, equivalent you want to put in there, you know, um, you you won't be able to uh, you, like is to close yourself off from uh, a whole segment of uh, important like parts of life. Right, right. No, I think I think it's absolutely right that the the most important things in life have to do with entertaining risk and taking that on. That's why when back in the days when I was teaching, one of the things, first things I tell my PhD students at the time, they, they didn't really know what I was talking about. And I think sometimes were offended was I would tell them, I will never take away from you your right to fail. <laughs> and, and what I meant by that is that if, if this is important, then you can fail at it. Because I think, I think C.S. Lewis has a wonderful line in there that if life is important, you can botch it up pretty badly. Is there, uh, you know, if someone's struggling with the risk language, would another side and maybe that connecting line to love is um, is the word responsibility? Would that be fair? Is that am I tracking with you? Yeah, I think it's on the same track. I mean, I mean, I do like the word risk. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're uh, responsible for something, it means that you can fail. That'd be the that's right, right. positive side of it. Yes, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you will be held to account for it. Right. Right. And that's, and that is to mitigate some of like, you know, obviously you, you don't want to come across as saying, you know, be reckless, right? It's like be right. responsible and you can't be responsible if there's nothing to lose. Right. Like, right. Like if I, if I, uh, just randomly spend my money in monopoly, um, it, no one would really look at me and be like, that's irresponsible. Right. <laughs> it's right. very different from spending money in real life or, uh, anything like that. Right. I mean, and particularly if you're responsible for someone else, you know, to, to spend that money recklessly when you really need that to, to put food on the table, uh, you know, uh, a shelter and things like that. then yes, you know, that's that's been taking uh, an irresponsible act in, in, in that risk of being a provider, risk of being a father, a husband and so on. Do you see any other unintended consequences um, from this or is this the main one that you see? It's the main uh, one. Those transhumanists. Some... Yeah, I think the other with the transhumanists is that it, it will create an increasingly intolerant society um, that almost every, I mean, there's a book that was written, I think, 60, 70 years ago called The Perfectibility of Man. And what the author is saying in there is almost every search for perfection always ends up badly and it always ends up with greater intolerance because you, you cannot 
tolerate those who refuse to become perfect or who are unable to become perfect. So and that, of course, better. that's your idea of perfection. That's right. And right. It's, always an, <laughs> it's always an imperfect idea of perfection. Because mm. it, it, it may be physical perfection or spiritual infect, perfection, moral perfection. And those are, by nature, always going to exclude some and not include everyone. When you talk about the judgmentalism you see in our culture, do you see, uh, and you, you see that growing, um, to say that transhumanism is the one doing that, I think some people might find that hard to swallow. But I think, what do you... When we think about the disembodiment of the internet, that's been a remarked upon. Like, do you, do you see that as like a major part of that judgmentalism? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the internet. I mean, at best, it's a mixed mix. It's a mixed bag. Um, I mean, you know, you can have multiple identities on the internet. Uh, you project. I mean, I forget who said it, but the reason they don't like. FaceTime is because it reminds of being back in high school and trying to get back to the cool table, you know, because of the way you, the way you present yourself. Um, and, and, um, and I think what the internet does is it allows you to, to do what we were a little bit like we were talking about uh, earlier, being irresponsible because you can, you can say anything because you, you don't really have to face the person that you've made the comments about. Right. Um, you can just say a lot of nonsense on the internet and get away with it. On, on the social media and um basically it seems it seems to me it's it's um what you're looking for is that opportunity to really condemn and to make someone look bad rather than to try to understand and maybe come to, you know seek some kind of reconciliation with that person the internet's just not a good media for that and i think um, you know, again, we were talking late earlier about it. Um, internet's really, I think, designed for people who want 30 second sound bites and not the, prolo I mean, I realize there's conversations and I realize there's a generational thing going on here and, and that sort of thing. But during the pandemic, for example, I hated zoom meetings and, and yet everything was on zoom, but I realized it's not the same thing as being face to face. It's not an adequate substitute. Yeah, I, and I, I, even as you're talking, I used to be on Facebook. I, I left several years ago um, at, one, at the height of one of the many political issues. And what I found myself doing is every night, I, uh, someone would, I would scroll through for about five minutes. I would find something, and I'd spend 30 minutes writing an angry rebuttal, and I would be angry. And then I would delete it, and I would not send it. Because I knew it wasn't a good place to say on Facebook. And I did this for like a week or two weeks <laughs> where I lost a half an hour every night just being angry. And I was like, I, I don't need this. But what allowed me to not send it was not the consequences on Facebook. It was me thinking of the person behind the, like, it, it was that recognition that this is a person, not, not, a, not a profile. Because if I thought, just in terms of the screen, it was very, it's very easy to just snap something off at somebody. I think that's right. And I think that's, that's been the problem with the internet, that people haven't had the discipline to say, let me think on this for a while before, before I send it. And it also, the, what the internet does is it, it makes people behind the screen invisible. Right. Effect, effectively. Right. And, and it's very easy to attack something that's invisible rather than an inflexible person. Um, and, and even further, I mean, I think, you know, um, I think podcasts are good, I think, you know, for conveying kinds of information and, and that sort of thing and, and bringing people into audiences. I think, you know, po podcasts are probably better than watching the evening news with the 30 second soundbite and, and that kind of thing. But my hope would be is that it, it doesn't become an excuse for not spending an evening uh, talking to a friend about many things around a fire and sharing a good single malt whiskey. I mean, there, <laughs> there, there's certain, there's certain kinds of things that, you know, this, this isn't, I mean, this is a good, what we're doing today is a good supplement, but it's not a substitute for, for conversation. If you, if you get what I mean. When you talk about a single malt whiskey around a fire, um, I may not know what the good life is, but I know it when I see it. That, that's a <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, 
yeah, that makes uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm and you kind of referenced this earlier, and I, I did say I wanted to talk about this when you talk about the Christian prescription for the good life. What model, or uh, like, do you have a, a metaphor, or a, in general, the how does the Christian prescription for the good life interact with the public square? What's the right way to handle that? That's a good question. Um, and when I'm in doubt, I, I tend to turn to St. Augustine. Okay, hard to beat that, yeah. <laughs> and I think he does model a kind of interaction of what it meant to, to search for it, because I think he, he had a profound insight into human nature in that he realized that unlike how we're sometimes tempted to believe, the problem of evil in our society is not, the, is not wickedness. I mean, you, you and I, or at least uh, I'll speak for me. I can't speak for you. I just don't <laughs> encounter very many wicked people. Hmm. What I encounter are morally clumsy people, um, silly people, stupid people. But um, <laughs> Morally <and> Augustine, clumsy. <laughs> Sorry, that's yeah. a great phrase. Sorry, go ahead. Um, and Augustine had a solution. He's saying basically we, our problem is disordered desire that we desire good things badly and that gets us into a lot of trouble. And I think what his encounter was, was is with the public, particularly as a Bishop trying to interact with Roman magistrates and, and, you know, uh, unruly priests, heretics was to say exam, you know, it's, it's a life of examination of trying to get your priorities in order of, of getting your desires in order. And that's just a lifetime ongoing kind of um, process. And I think the other thing he recognized, which I think is important, is um, the notion of, of, of the good life, the Christian life, is a life of pilgrimage. Um, in, in, in a very real sense, we don't belong here, and therefore we belong anywhere where God might call us, for however long or short a period of time that may be. Um, so it gives us a way of, of saying, you know, wherever I am, it must, it, it, I'm called there to love the place that I'm, I'm at because that's where God has called me to be for this time. So it's, it's remarkable that Stephen Stills actually ends up being a pretty good theologian when he says, if you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. Now, properly understood and, and stripping that from kind of the, the cer certain kinds of connotations, that's actually very good advice because it says rather than pining where you can't be, learn to love where you are. And, and be be attentive to the people in your immediate presence, and you're again you're dealing with in other imperfect beings, and and that's what part of that life is learning to be that 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 faithful companion, if you will. And there's an interesting twist on what you just said. You know, you talked about loving other people, but one of the people you need to love in that way is yourself, right? Like I played basketball, and you talk about like the athletic, like man, I would really love myself if I was, you know, seven, two and incredibly gifted, you know, like six ten, and I could, <laughs> and I had a three and a half foot vertical. I would, man, I would love that PJ, but that's not, I need to love the PJ that I, that I am. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Because I mean, uh, otherwise you, and I, I think the two are related. If, if you can't love who you are, then you will loathe yourself. And in loathing yourself, I think you, you also loathe others. Because you don't see the capacity to really relate with them. So I, th I think you're right. I mean, I, you know, I just was really irritated with God for a long time that I couldn't throw a 100 mile per hour fastball. I mean, I couldn't even throw a 70 mile per hour fastball. So it was, you know, that ruined my chances for my going to Major League Baseball. So that's a, um, and, and, and once you realize, well, okay, uh, that's just not going to happen then how do I love myself for the imperfect being that I am? I mean, or if you want to use terribly antiquated language, how do I love myself for the sinner that I am? And it's not to love the sin, but it is to love the fact that I am a sinner in need of grace. And to accept that with gratitude, like you mentioned yes. earlier. And I, I think the, like that stance of gratitude is something that, um, you know, makes sense to everyone. Like, uh, the, the people who are truly grateful are just really wonderful to be around. They are. They are. And, and there's almost, um, 
you begin to realize that to be childlike is not the same thing to be childish. There, there, there is that childlike simplicity that's, you know, deep and profound. So if I'm talking to uh, my neighbor and uh, they're not Christian, how should I present this uh, Christian uh, model of the good life? Is it as like, would it be better to do it from like a natural theology standpoint as kind of this moral intuition that we would expect them to share? Would it, is it more like a metaphysical dialogue where we like, we find out what their presuppositions are and ours are and trying to find where they match? Are there, does that make sense? Like, I think there's slight differences in those. Yeah, I, I think you can. I mean, I think increasingly I turn to uh, good fiction novels. Mm. I mean, the last years that I was teaching in the classroom, increasingly I was using novels because I had to find new ways to, to trick my students into thinking theologically. And, and novels are a good way to do that because it kind of, it captures where they are in a sense, and, and you can expand from that. So, um, you know, if you run into a neighbor that, and you want to present the gospel because you believe that, you know, the gospel is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and you know, their life is deficient without that, um, my first recommendation would be to read The Lord of the Rings. Because it kind of prepares you. There's so many themes in there that are so central to Christian faith. For you know, loyalty, uh, friendship. Um, you know, the, the, the real hero of that story is, is Sam, not Frodo. Um, who you know is steadfast and, and is there day in and day out. And I think at this, you know, it, it prepares them then to receive the gospel and the Christians because it's sort of you're, you're doing the pre-work of it. I mean, so I, I guess I, what I'm arguing for is fiction as, as a kind of evangelism. You know, um, again, C.S. Lewis, you know, has the insight that he thinks, you know, um, um, reading good pagan philosophy is much better than reading post-Christian philosophy, because at least the, the, the pagans still believed in God. And there was a way of, of, of preparing the person for that. Yeah, again, uh, almost, I love reading science fiction, always have since I was a kid. And almost to flip what you're saying, when you talk about evangelism, uh, you know, good fiction as evangelism, um, as soon as I had read any of the transhumanist arguments, uh, not only did I, like, I did not have to struggle with them at all, and I fully kind of felt like I understood what they were aiming for, because, I mean, when you talk about, like, things like, I don't know how familiar you are with, like, um, Ghost in the Shell, uh, uh, some of Philip K. Dick's work, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what is it? Um, dream, uh, oh, shoot, it's about dreaming, uh, uh dreaming about, uh, and electric, do Android, oh, yeah, yeah, electric the cheap. Became, yes. uh, Blade Runner, Blade Runner yeah. yes, yeah. um, and, uh, you, you think about these sorts of things, um, um, and what's interesting is there are sorts of the unintended consequences too. Like I was uh, like, I, I felt like I was immediately aware of some of the problems that would arise in terms of like, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the Android's dream of electric sheep. Ah, got the title. Um, but the, uh, the mood organ, right? Like this idea of like, you can just immediately manipulate your emotions. And if we were this kind of mind in a box, you know, obviously he's uh, slightly different there, but if we were a mind in a box, like, what would it mean that we could manipulate our emotions like they were circuits, right? Um, right. Um, and that's an unintended, you know, that it's a very thorny ethical question all of a sudden, right? Um, and other people could hack our emotions. Like, that's a very, <laughs> like, very, like, you start getting into a lot of very strange questions. Um, and so, like, I, I think this, there is a real, uh, an important dialogue happening in the realm of fiction around like uh, these sorts of questions. No, and I think that's right. And I think that, you know, for a while I, I kind of immersed myself a little bit into cyberpunk because, you know, it, it was really a way of saying, okay, how do I understand a world that seems very foreign to me? Um, as, and again, it's a generational thing, but I think cyberpunk really, I really began to realize, okay, um, how you encounter this new world is, is, is a world in constant flux and fluidity. And I think we're beginning to see the consequences of that kind of thought 
that's actually been there prior, where now even even gender and sexuality are fluid. And and there's no so how do you, how do you navigate a world of no givens and a highly mobile what I would call um, a, a nomadic world. And I think that there again, as Christians, pilgrims can actually engage nomads. The biggest difference is that pilgrims are not just wandering aimlessly; they're headed somewhere. And there, and, but there's a way of encounter. Uh, by the way, a, a short, a short digression. If you ever get a chance, go on the Wired. Uh, net, or try to go into their archives. They sent William Gibson over decades ago to write a, a, an article on Singapore. And he entitled it Disneyland with the death penalty. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just, it's just William Gibson at his best. So. Yes. Yeah. I, and I've read, I mean, this is definitely, I mean, this is part of the reason I was excited about this interview, but this is a lot. I, I've read a lot of cyberpunk, very familiar with William Gibson, you know? Um, uh, yeah. And that sounds like something you would write. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Um, so as we kind of, you know, um, wow, looking at our time, uh, but I wanted to ask you about maybe some of the particular issues, uh, you know, you say, you talk about, uh, uh, theologically reflecting and reproductive medicine. You talked about writing about, um, and part of this is just how fast the technology changes is that I haven't heard about embryonic cell research in a while, <laughs> but, um, uh, what were some of your conclusions that you drew from the incarnation about embryonic cell research? Yeah, how, how increasingly we were turning, I mean, I mean, in the first place, we no longer call it, called it procreation, we called it reproduction. So that we were medicalizing the problem of childlessness. So it, it suddenly became something that had a technical, technological fix. But that changed a lot of things. That it, it just basically said that um, becoming a parent wasn't so much a calling and being in a position to receive the gift of a child to care for. It meant that basically um, it was, again, a, a, an act of will of which te technology helped someone achieve. So um, that does a lot of things. I mean, basically it meant that we no longer thought in terms of, of receiving a gift. And there's many ways to receive a gift. Maybe one means of receiving that gift was through procreation between, you know, husband and wife, but maybe another way to receive that gift was through adoption or, or foster care. You know, there, there, there's multiple means to, 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 to be receptive to that gift. And, but, but this whole thing was, was changing. It was even kind of slipping adopt something like the process of adoption into simply one more reproductive option. And subtly we were changing that adoption was created to meet the best interests of the child, not to solve the problem of, 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 of childlessness. And yet we, we subtly began to change that. And my research on it was, was to discover, you know, once a child's past a certain age, the chances of them being adopted falls dramatically. Right. So, you know, but the best interest of that child is to get them into a home. And it kind of subtly switches the whole the whole moral um, notion of it. So, what my concern was was increasingly, if if you begin to, to make it a technical process, you're also going to assert not only the, the problem of childlessness, but if if you have the right to have a child, then you have the right to have the child of your choosing. And therefore, as the means becomes there, you will begin to engage in what's called quality control. That will initially be preventing certain unwanted characteristics, but perhaps later on adding wanted characteristics. So, you know, to be crass, then the child simply becomes uh, the outcome of their parents will. And the child is not a radical other. They become but, a product. Yeah. Product. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think there's, I mean, I think that's wrong at a whole level whole lot of different levels it's um you know, you know um it's hard enough to be a child but when the, when you turn them into something but they're expected to fulfill all your hopes and desires i don't see how anyone can, can carry that burden it, it seems like one of the main uh intuitions if i can put it that way that uh, you keep sharing is there's this 
movement towards mastery, yes, right, versus gratitude. And I would say part of that gratitude that you kind of reference is giving, right? Like this idea that like I want to create a certain type of life, an act of my will, versus like I receive what I am given and I give back, right? And so whatever child I receive, I give back to that child. I receive the child as a gift and I give to the child. Um, and it very similarly, like what I, like I receive a certain body and I give back to that body and I steward that body. Um, and, uh, you know, even as you're talking about that perfection earlier, like this idea that we are masters, um, I think that this, this concern with mastery over our, ourselves, uh, I'm not sure that I, I would say it automatically. I'd want to think on it more, but I could see how that would be uh, like, that would be dangerous, right? Like this idea that like, I'm in charge. Um, yeah. When really, like, even like, this is not necessarily a Christian thing. I mean, you look at the Stoics, like, right. like, <laughs> like, uh, no, you, there's a lot. You just like, <laughs> you, you, what you're in control of is not so much. Like, <laughs> right, right. Well, it's okay. There's a very interesting Canadian philosopher that I read quite a bit. My name is George Grant. Died around 1986, I think. But he he was always trying to come to terms with uh, Martin Heidegger, which, which is no easy chore. But um. He really criticizes the entire technological proje project precisely in terms of mastery because he says what it's really about is the mastery of nature and human nature. And that's what technology is about, is, is ultimately, you know, I'm in control. Now, he says the danger of that is, is that actually when you seek mastery, you usually end up being enslaved because of the very process. And I later learned from some of his students, he was very fond of a Spanish proverb that he used to quote ad nauseum. But I think it's, whenever I try to think about technology more broadly, I try to think of this proverb and he said, take what you want, said God, take it and pay for it. And all I think that simply is saying is nothing is going to be free. You are going to give up certain things for whatever kinds of technology you adopt. So I think the same thing's true of reproductive technologies. Yes, it may solve certain kinds of problems, but it's going to create others. It's not going to be free. And it does alter the, the parent-child relationship. I, I can't tell you how happy it makes me that I was, a, the, before I asked that previous question, the other question I was considering was about Heidegger's question concerning technology, yeah. because it's about like this, this idea of uh, what in framing means, right? Like this idea of like, I'm going to like, I'm going to make things fit my box and fit my comprehension instead of allowing it to, you know, you talked about, especially with uh, reproductive stuff, this idea of the radical other. And if I get to determine everything about this person and I, and you know, parents run into this all the time. It's like, I'm going to send my kid to school and they're going to get these grades and I'm going to have them do these, you know, uh, hopefully parents don't do this, but I know parents who do, uh, they're going to, they're going to do these sports and they're going to have be this kind of honor student be on this honor roll. And the idea is that you're going to, and then some kids, uh, and in some ways they're almost the less fortunate ones, conform to that. And then <laughs> sometimes parents do that and they're like, oh, they're not doing, <laughs> Right. <laughs> they have their own ideas. What? <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. 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 I, and I, I think you see it in subtle kinds of ways that that actually should be more disturbing than they are. Okay. We, we live in a neighborhood where it has a lot of young families. Um, I rarely see the kids out playing. Uh, and I, my hunch is, is they're either indoors, at certain kinds of activities or they're, or they're carted off to other activities, but they strike me as, as not having too many opportunities for just spontaneous play. It's, it's a very planned, managed kind of life. And I'm not necessarily criticizing the parents, but I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, part of of a rich human life is being playful and, and playful playfulness is really spontaneous. Now, the other thing about play is that you gotta have good rules or you can't play well, but that's where you also learn how to play by, you know, playing by rules, but there's a lot of spontaneity involved in that. And that's what I think. Another thing that I think is, is kind of leaving our society or our social, our life together is a sense of playfulness. I just don't, I see, I just see it less and less. I mean, uh, I, one of the things I discovered after 21 years of teaching at the seminary was toward the end of the career, I had to be really careful of my humor. Um, 
where in early on, you know, there there was almost an appreciation of it, and that that quickly faded. It was just a different generation of students who did not see humor in quite the same way as I did. So. Uh, as a dad who loves indulging in dad jokes, I really okay. felt the pain beside behind you saying they almost appreciate it. Not that they appreciated your humor earlier; they almost appreciated it. That's <laughs> but yes, yeah. Uh, the The moral of the story, though, is is understood. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of as we as we look here and and we uh, we wrap up. Um, what is a uh, final takeaway you would leave for the audience? Well, it's a theme that we've been talking about throughout this interview. And, you know, Roger Scruton was, was a very interesting philosopher. And, you know, they, they, they finally post posthumously published some of his last uh, journal entries. And I think the last one shortly before he died said something to the effect, in the end, everything is gratitude. And I think, you know, going back to this, if there's a takeaway, the good Christian life is a life of gratitude. Um, I don't think I could say it any better than that. Um, to be grateful for what you have received, even if it's not always what you thought maybe you deserved. Uh, is nonetheless, it was given to you and entrusted to your care. Um, and so uh, that would be my takeaway that, I mean, from, from that book. And also, like, I mean, probably if I were to write the book now, it would be a different book because I'm 20, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm older now. But it would be to try to infuse that book with a little more gratitude. I can't think of a, a better or more winsome message to you. Uh, and, uh, today's interview with um, Dr. Waters. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you. 